Amen. Welcome to Glenview Church of the Nazarene this first Sunday of December. And uh, from the spiritual perspective, it's the first Sunday of Advent. Always a very special time of year, and we're so glad that you've chosen to spend a part of that Advent season worshiping with us. If you're here, you have received a bulletin, and uh, I was reminded this week that uh, we have important information that is in that bulletin. And uh, if you hear these words in response to, I didn't know that was going on, you will hear from the pastor very gently, it was in the bulletin. Uh, so we, again, we just want to encourage you to take a look at that, and uh, you will be very much informed of what's taking place. You'll see the schedule for Advent. Our theme for this Christmas season is Simply Christmas. And uh, we're featuring not only the Christmas tree, but the cross of Jesus Christ. And then also, this is the second week where we are encouraging you, if you'd like to participate in a love offering in the memory of Cameron McCrary, to help uh, fulfill some of the financial responsibilities that uh, accompanied his untimely passing. For our call to worship this entire month, we take Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and from the New Living Translation, it simply says this, they bowed down and worshipped the Christ child. Throughout this Advent season, may we experience the grace to have a simple Christmas in which we do not forget to bow down and worship the Christ child. And when we truly worship, the writer goes on to say that the Magi then opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts. Lord, as we come together on this first Sunday of Advent 2023, our prayer is that you would prepare our hearts so that we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth through this Advent season. We thank you for the good news of the holiday Christmas season. And now as we worship you, as we lift up our song, our voices in song, as we read the scriptures, as we reflect on the ways of your kingdom, as we pray together and as we open up our Bibles, Lord, may your kingdom come. And when we see your son, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, may we humbly bow before him, open up our treasure chests, the chests of our heart, and give him the gifts that he has so graciously given us. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. sure Chuck could put up with it. So, but I'm always excited when it's our turn to sing Christmas carols and songs about the birth of Jesus in our uh, assembly. So let's sing What Child Is This? What child Shabbat 
where it says, come peasant king, not royal kings, not princes, but peasants, peasant king, any of us, the rich, the poor, everybody in between, come and bring him Lord, the king, the babe, the son of Mary. Amen. So now let's sing... God rest you, Mary, gentlemen. As I say every year, we sing this, because this is one of my favorites, so we sing every year. God rest you, Mary, comma, gentlemen. Okay? Not Mary, gentlemen, but Mary. God rest you, Mary. Gentlemen, women, kids, all of us. God rest you, Mary. like to be seated, and if you would like to take your Bibles, we are going to read uh, three brief portions of Scripture. Uh, the first two are found in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 7 and chapter 9, and then we'll go over to the New Testament and we'll read uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 through 23. Uh, today's theme was the first song that we sang together, What Child is this. Or to put it maybe a more contemporary phraseology, well, what is it about this child? And then the Old Testament book of Isaiah, and in the New Testament book of Matthew, 
we find keen insight into the answer to the question, what is it about this child? First of all, Isaiah chapter 7, if you would look at verse 10 through 14, it's picked up in the middle of the description of an account, and we'll fully develop that account as we look into the Word during the time of teaching. But verse 10 of Isaiah chapter 7 says, Again, in other words, for the second time, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, and the words were this, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. Verse 12, But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. If you'll turn over to the ninth chapter, in the ninth chapter, the first six verses, we once again have an account of what Isaiah says to Ahaz. Chapter 9, verse 1, here's the promise. Nevertheless, no matter how dark it may be, the context tells us, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the days of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdened them, the bar across their sh shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. Well, how can that be? Verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. To give us the New Testament insight into these prophecies, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to the very first chapter of the New Testament. Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, provides us with further insight concerning the question, well, what's the big deal about this child? Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, he quotes the Old Testament passage that we just read. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, which again says this, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Well, what does that mean? I'm glad you asked. 
It means God is with us. May the reading of the word be blessed, and may the opening of the teaching of the word be doubly blessed as we spend time the next 45 minutes or so looking together at the truth of what it's found in God's holy word. Let's continue to sing. to sing about Emmanuel. Let's prepare our hearts for prayer. As pastor said, Emmanuel means God with us. So who knows what's going to come this week, but we can rest assured that God goes with us, whatever comes, whatever we have to do. And I know that Sandy told us that she lost her, her sister uh, just a couple of days ago. And um, so as they travel to Tennessee, God is going to go with them. And he is going to um, be their front guard and their rear guard, whatever comes. But not only as she travels those miles, but as she does what she needs to do to, um, to help the family. And so we just know and we just ask that the Lord go with us also, whatever comes this week. So let's sing Emmanuel and the, the 
altars are open. There are a few flower arrangements there, but plenty of room for us. So let's sing Emmanuel. Again, could we? Let's sing it again. We reach out to him. Lord be with us. we've been singing these songs of the Advent season, especially that old hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We were reminded of that the hope that is lasting, a hope that goes way beyond the holiday season, is found in the reality of Jesus Christ, who is God with us. And Lord, as we sang that one verse, it said, May arguing and bickering and strivings cease. And Lord, we've been out already in the holiday rush. And in my own life, there was one who expressed kindness and graciousness because they saw I was limping and so they paused and stopped the car let me go across the parking lot. And Lord, as I turned to thank them, I noticed the person behind them was cussing them out because he was in such a hurry. Lord, unfortunately, that scene probably will take place in the highways and byways and on the sidewalks and in the stores throughout our world the next three to four weeks. And Lord, our prayer is that there was, this would be a time of enlightenment, a time of the light of God shining in the darkness. And Lord, our prayer is that uh, our congregation, the people who are a part of the Glenview Church of the Nazarene, may we be examples of the kindness and graciousness and love. May we be light in the world when everybody's rushing around. May we truly be able to reflect the, the theme of simply Christ, simply Christmas. And may we, in the midst of all the decorating of the holiday trees and sharing of gifts, may we be reminded and may our light point to the fact of Jesus Christ and the tree upon which he died and the light 
of eternal peace, the light of salvation, the light of hope that comes when we give our attention to Jesus Christ. May Christ be the focus of this Advent season for those of us who are followers of you. We do pray for members of the congregation. Uh, we think of Luella who yesterday and through this past week they mourned and placed to rest their brother Bobby. We pray that you would comfort them. May Emmanuel be God with them during this time. And then we do pray for Sandy and her sisters and the family as they come together there in Tennessee this week and as decisions are made and as they go through the process of beginning to grieve the loss of a very special person. Lord, may you come. May you be with them. And Lord, we pray that the hope of Jesus Christ would undergird them throughout the coming days. And it seems so unfair at times to think that the beginning of Advent includes laying one of our loved ones to rest. But even though it may be dark, the good news is that Jesus Christ is God with us. He is God for us. And he is God who wants to save us. We do pray for the other concerns of our congregation. We pray that if there are those who just providentially could not be here today, that uh, you would encourage them, uh, that you would be with them and just remind them that though they may not be present here physically, that in spirit uh, you they are here and we are praying for them. And Lord, we have a concern also for those who just choose not to be here. Lord, we really would love to see this holiday season be extra special for our congregation. And Lord, I pray that we would not allow the busyness of our world to cause us to not give proper attention to the reason for the season. And Lord, we pray for those who not only have chosen not to be here today, but we pray for those who are developing a habit of withdrawing. And it's with love, it's with concern that we ask that you would be very real to them. And we pray that you would shine brightly through the Advent season. And Lord, as we interact with them, as we come together with some of them for holiday gatherings, please shine through us. We sang together, God with us, God in us, God through us. And that is our prayer. Again, Lord, we thank you for this special kind of time of year. And we just pray that as we celebrate this first Sunday of Advent and as we open up your word now, may we truly experience the depth of what Scripture teaches when it says that he is Emmanuel, God with us. Let's sing it together one more time. you. He is God with us. And we are his light. We are his light. reminding ourselves of that great promise, all the people of God said, amen and amen. As you're taking your seats, I'd encourage you to take your Bibles or your devices and once again turn to the Word of God as it unfolds in Isaiah chapter 7. I'd encourage you to keep your Bibles open and we will be reviewing again the Scriptures 
uh, that we read together. And as we've already noted, the question, the first of four questions that we'll be asking through this Advent season from the Word of God is this. What child is this? Or to put in a more contemporary title, what's the big deal about this child? It's a very appropriate question. In the hustle and bustle of all that's going to take place in most of the homes of our culture during the next four weeks, we will be hearing play through the sound systems on, at, uh, in malls and at different stores. They'll be playing even Christmas songs. And I noticed that some of them play traditional Christmas hymns. And the truth is, those hymns point to the reality of Jesus Christ and the birth of the Son of God. And so even unconsciously, if we listen very carefully, we uh, can find an answer to the question, what's the big deal about this child? I mean, let's think about it. What's the big deal about a child born in an insignificant village, Bethlehem, in an insignificant manger, in an insignificant barn 2,000 years ago. I mean, come on. I mean, all these songs, all these bells, all these whistles, what's the big deal about this child? I mean, think about it. Annually, in the United States, 4 million babies are born. Every year, 4 million babies are born in the United States. They tell us that most popular day to be born is Tuesday. They also tell us that uh, Monday ranks number two. If we can just get through the weekend, I'm not sure what that means, but... Uh, were you, ever, were you born in September? Let me see your hands. Anybody here born in September? Okay. You are a member of the most popular month to be born in. Congratulations. <laughs> Babies are born all the time. And th think about it. When there is a baby that's going to arrive, we have often asked some very basic questions. When is it due? When's the approximate time of arrival? Is it going to be a boy or is it going to be a girl? Have you done anything to make a room? I mean, we ask all kinds of questions, basic questions, and we find out and hear that a child is going to be born. And so it's appropriate that we stop and think in terms of, well, and the fact that it happens day after day, week after week and month after month, four million times annually in our nation. What's so special about that Christ child that uh, we are asked to celebrate every Christmas? Why so special? Because first of all, Jesus Christ, as we've said at least a dozen times, through this hour together, Jesus is God with us. And to understand that fact, we need to go back 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus. We have to go back to Isaiah chapter 7. And so not only do we have those who say, well, this child born this, in this insignificant village, in this insignificant manger, in an insignificant barn 2,000 years ago, now you're going to ask us to go back another 700 years? Yes. To fully answer the question, what's the big deal about this child? We need to go 2,700 years ago to a place that was given the name Jerusalem. It's the capital of the nation of Israel. Judah. And the thing that we have to understand is when we talk about Jerusalem, the capital of the nation of Judah, we have to understand that the nation of God, the nation of Israel, for 160 years approximately, was united. They had three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. 
But after that about 160-year period, there is a civil war, and the nation of God splits in two. And here's where it gets kind of confusing. When the nation of God splits in two, the ten tribes to the, to the north are called Israel still, and the southern kingdom is now called Judah. Okay? So 2,700 years ago, 700 years prior to the birth of Jesus, the nation splits in two, the north being Israel and the south being Judah. And the context of Isaiah chapter 7 is that King Ahaz, the ruler of the southern kingdom, faces a real political difficult situation. That nation is under attack. There are two other nations that are planning to attack the nation of Judah. The two united forces who are now the enemies of Judah are, this one really hurts, Israel, Judah's brothers and sisters, and also Syria. And what we have is the northern kingdom of Israel has come together with the nation of Syria, and they have united to take over and attack the nation of Judah. And so King Ahaz has to make a decision. What are we going to do? How should we respond to this attack from our enemies? That's when the prophet Isaiah enters into the scene. And the prophet Isaiah goes to King Ahaz, and he says simply, Don't worry. Don't be concerned. The Lord wants me to tell you that he has everything under control. I am sovereign, and don't be concerned. Don't be overwhelmed with fear. In fact, you know what it has? God wants me to tell you that if you want a sign of his presence and his promise, I'll give you a sign. I want you to not only hear how powerful I am, I want you to see how powerful I am. Now, you know what Ahaz does? He says, well, no. I don't want to put God to the test. This is amazing how when we have opportunities to express faith, that fear can cancel out the invitation to a step of faith. Ahaz rejects the offer, and we read how Isaiah then says, hey, God is going to give you a sign anyway. Even though you want your sovereignty to supersede God's sovereignty, God wants to give you a sign, and the sign that he gives is in chapter 14 of Isaiah chapter 7, which is this. The virgin will be with child. And the virgin will give birth to a son, a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The promise of God's sovereignty is seen in the fact that there's going to be a child, and this child will be born 700 years later. Now, to fully grasp the impact and the importance of the promise given to King Ahaz in 714, we've got to remind ourselves of the full story of God as it's found in Scripture. See, what we tend to do is we take particular portions of Scripture and we associate them with different holiday seasons, and because we emotionally tie ourselves to a particular passage of scripture for a particular holiday season, we miss the great movement of God 24-7, 365. And I feel very confident in saying that, uh, you know, the passage of scripture that we read together this morning, oh yeah, we read those on Christmases before. So let's pull them together and let's remind ourselves of the full story of God concerning what's the big deal about this child. Well, we have to go back to Genesis 1 and 2, to the opening chapters of God's Word. 
In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we have the description of how God created our world and how when God created the world, he placed humanity, he placed people in the center of that garden, and they experienced perfect unity and perfect harmony. The plan of God is what? That we realize and walk in the fact that he is with us. Well, the story, unfortunately, hits a big barrier in Genesis chapter 3. Because people were told to enjoy anything in the garden, except they were not to even eat, never eat from the tree of the knowledge of good or evil. The enemy comes in, he walks in as a serpent, and he tempts them. In fact, the temptation is very subtle. He comes to Eve, who's accompanied by her husband, Adam. And in my own translation, what we read is that the, the invitation to be disobedient to God was this. Hey, why do you need anyone to tell you what to do? You can be your own God. You can make your own decisions. If you're going to enjoy a fulfilled life, do your own thing, man. And we read that Adam and Eve rebelled against God's rule. You want to know the basic definition of sin? Well, it's right in the middle of the word. The middle of the word sin is the letter what? I. See, so you want to get to the bottom line of sin? Sin is simply, I am on the throne. I am most important. It's all about me. And nobody's going to tell me what to do, even you, God. Now, what is so beautiful in the midst of this terrible decision of people is that God addresses the enemy. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 15, he tells Satan, hey, from now on, there's going to be a real war going on. There's going to be a battle going on all the time. It's going to be taking place in the spiritual realm, and it will definitely impact what's going on in the physical realm. The war were between you and the child that's born of a woman. See, this child, the reason he is so significant is that in the eternity of eternities, God had a plan. And the plan was that when people chose to put themselves in the middle of their lives, and when they chose themselves to be the ruler of their lives, and when they shake their fist at God and say, I'm going to do what I want to do, he had a plan to bring them back. And that plan was, a woman will give birth to this child. And I love the words of that first promise of Jesus. The first promise of this child in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, is, hey, there's going to be a war going on, but the bottom line is, you're going to bruise the child's heel, but when you bruise the child's heel, you know what he's going to do? He's going to crush your head! Oh, yeah. I love that. This child. This child. This child. He is God with us. And not only do we see it in the opening chapters of the book, of the Old Testament book of Genesis, if we leap forward and we go to the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 1, it's the passage of Scripture that we read earlier. This child is so special. He is God with us. And we see it in the opening of God's story. And as the New Testament is unveiled, we see that he once again, God once again wants to remind us of the significance of this child. And in Chapter 1, verse 22 of Matthew's Gospel, we read there, 
Matthew says all of this, the birth of Jesus and the, re the revelation of Joseph to Joseph of what God's plan is, it all took place to fulfill what the Lord promised through the prophet, which is what the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son, and they will call him God with us, Emmanuel. 700 years prior to Jesus' birth, Ahaz the king is under the pressure of a very dark time. He's under attack. There's the fear of being captured. It's the fear of the destruction of God's people. And the promise of God is there's going to be a son. And this child is God with us. And we can stop there and think, man, that's good stuff. No, hang on. There's an even greater depth to the promise of God. And for that, we go over to chapter 8 and 9 of Isaiah. And uh, the context of the verses we read there, verse 1 through 6 of chapter 9, is the threat still continues. Ahaz and the people of Judah face and uh, an invasion. Now their brothers and sisters, Israel, they've backed off, and they are no longer a part of the union with Syria. But the truth is, in chapters 8 and 9, Syria, once again, is a threat to the nation of Judah. And uh, so what happens? Isaiah pops in there once again. And he once again gives the assurance of God's promise. Chapter 9, verse number 2. In this dark hour, there will be no more gloom for those in distress. Wow. Verse 2 goes on. Excuse me, that's verse 1. There will be no more gloom. gloom. Verse 2. Those walking in darkness have seen a great light. Notice the contrast. Darkness. Light. Gloom. Light. Distress. Light. They will see a great light. And those uh, who are in living in the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Well, how is that going to happen? I'm glad you asked, Isaiah says, verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Once again, the promise, the central truth is, it's the significance of this child. And the beautiful thing about this passage, it's not only the reality that he is God with us, here's a great Truth, he is God for us. Amen? Yeah. Well, we got one person that thinks so. <laughs> one of my concerns each Christmas season is that we who hang around the church have heard the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, and it's very easy for us to fall into the temptation to say, yeah, I heard that, knew that, yeah, yeah. Got the nativity scene, yeah, yeah. May we not miss the impact of the fact that the birth of Jesus Christ, the significance of this child's birth, he's not only God with us, but he's for us. How do we know that? Verse 6 goes on. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. The word wonderful there in the original language could be translated supernatural. He's a counselor, and he's a supernatural counselor. He's a counselor from above. This child is a king who's going to provide wisdom from above. He never gives us foolish counsel. Huh? From the human perspective, what he informs us and calls us to do, from the human perspective may seem foolish. 
But when we truly by faith respond to this special child, he is not only a counselor, he is a wonderful counselor, and he will always offer divine counsel from the throne room of God who is all-knowing and all-wise. He's for us. Not only that, he's called mighty God. The word mighty there is the word warrior. <laughs> this child fights for us. Please understand that taking Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and pulling in these other passages of Scripture, specifically Isaiah chapter 9, we read that the birth of Christ and the arrival of Jesus Christ into our world is a declaration of war. A war between the eternal principles of God and the principles of the enemy, which is what sin where I is in the middle of everything. This truth that God is for us and that Jesus is fighting for us, and that victory is ours because of the victory found in Christ's death and resurrection, it's repeated over and over in the New Testament. In the sheet, in the insert of your uh, bulletins where you have the notes on the sermon, you'll see the various scriptures. We won't take time to look them up right now, but I just want to highlight them for you. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Chapter 8 verse 3 of Romans, for what the law is powerless to do, God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be an offering. And so because Jesus came as an offering, he condemned to do away with, destroy sin's control. He declared an end to sin's control. He came to set right once and for all everything. Amen. There's a war. And Jesus wins. Yeah. It's the expression that Jesus is God for us. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. God has made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Well, thanks be to God. Yes, I'm glad I'm forgiven. Don't stop there. He not only has forgiven our sins, but he's canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that op opposed us. He destroyed sin's opposition to our lives. How did he do that? Well, he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Jesus not only forgives us, he wins the war. Against sin. He, for, he is for us and he is fighting for us. Two more. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, we're human, we're flesh and blood. Jesus too shared in our humanity. Why? So that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free us all of our lives who've been held by fear, slaves to the fear of death. Then finally, the one that just sums it up so well, John's first letter, chapter 3, verse 8. You want a good definition of why this child is so significant? And what's the big deal about Jesus' birth at Christmas? John says, the reason the Son of God appeared. What's that? Right. Christmas, Advent. He appeared to destroy the devil's work. Wow. Jesus is God for us. And then he also says he's an everlasting father. He's a father who has 
our interest always at best. I don't care how good an earthly ruler may be. The truth is every earthly ruler throughout history has always had mixed motives in their leadership. They may have had some care and compassion for others, but a great desire behind much of what they did was selfishness. And they were interested in making decisions that enable their own personal gain. And then finally, he'll be called Prince of Peace. And verse 7 goes on to say there in this passage, Isaiah chapter 9, that there will never be an end to his peace. It is a never-ending peace. Have you been watching the news this week? Every national broadcast talked about if the peace between Israel and Hamas would last. A lot of good things are taking place because of the ceasefire and this agreed peace. But what happened Friday? Well, they're arguing out who shot first and who killed first. And the peace went. (laughs) Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And it's an everlasting peace. It's a peace that's not seasonal in nature. It's a peace that's not externally motivated in nature. It's a peace that's deep within our being because we realize that he is God for us and he is God with us. Want to pull it all together? Hope you do. Because it's the next and final point. Jesus is God who saves us. The whole story of Jesus is critical to our lives of faith. Please hear that statement. I hope you don't grow weary of it for the next four weeks. The whole story of Jesus, not just his birth, but the whole story of Jesus is critical to one's life of faith. Because the truth is, this child was not only born, but he grew to live a perfect life of obedience And because he lived a perfect life of obedience, it qualified him to be the spotless lamb of God so that he could be the sacrifice to pay for the penalty and destroy the power of sin. He's God with us. He's for us. He's fighting the battle, and he's won the battle. What are we doing about it? How are we responding to the fact that he saves us from the penalty and power of sin? Sin, Genesis chapter 3, my life 2023, sin always brings chaos, disorder, and disease into a world. Sin always brings darkness that just kind of hovers over life. And the truth is that dark cloud hangs over the season of joy. As I noted in my prayer, such a gracious moment quickly became a moment of darkness when F-bombs address the person who showed the kindness. This dark cloud hangs over even this season of joy and the truth is it may even be hanging over my own family. And you know what we need? We need hope. It's the light that shines in The darkness. It's Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, the first 
uh, paragraph of that great gospel, the gospel of John. Jesus is the son of God. John wants to understand that Jesus is the son of God. And that when he comes, if you receive him, you will experience life. And the life is the light of all people. And in chapter 1 of John, verse 5, he says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and cannot overcome it. Amen! That's the message of Christmas. It's so dark. It's wrong. No! We're not being unrealistic. We don't have our head in the clouds and ignore. No! What we are understanding is that we must learn from the example of Ahaz, who was given the promise of the sign of this child. No. No, no. John goes on to say in John chapter 1, what is really unfortunate, even though the light shines in the darkness and destroys the darkness, there are some who will not believe. But to those who believe, there is life. May the bad decision of Ahaz not be yours and my decision. May we receive the promise of this child. God with us, God for us, and God who saves us. Let's pray. Emmanuel. The wonderful counselor the counselor from above, the divine wisdom of God himself, the mighty warrior, the one who is fighting for us, the one who's provided victory over the I, the me, the my of sin. And the summary statement that he is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, who is the God who saves us. And Lord, our prayer is that we would move way beyond just one aspect of the truth that we find concerning your Son, our brother, Jesus Christ. May we not only claim his presence during this Advent season, but may we humbly accept the fact, and when we're often tempted to question if he's for us or against us. May we look at the scriptures and realize there's no question Jesus Christ is God for us. He's fighting for us. He wants us to return to the unity and the harmony and the peace that surpasses all our human understanding. He wants to break through the darkness. He wants to shine brightly in the darkness. And Lord, may we realize that that will take place if and only if we trust Christ to save us. Forgive us for treating our salvation so lightly. Forgive us for taking your provision of life eternal for granted. Forgive us for having a faith that's built on a decision that was made 20 years ago, a membership card that was filled out or a pastor's receiving us into a specific church. Lord, forgive us for treating your salvation so with such a disregard. And Lord, we pray that we be reminded of your amazing grace. And that you not only saved us past tense, but you are saving us present tense. And you will continue to shine through us. Throughout this Advent season, we're ask, we'll be asking and answering what questions? 
And today the question is, what's so special about this child? And we need to ask ourselves individually the answer to that question. My favorite Christmas hymn will be sung a lot here the next few weeks. It says that it's a silent night. It's a holy night. And this is the part that just really humbles me. All is calm and all is bright. The light is shining. And there's a peace in the midst of all the turmoil. The last verse talks about God's redeeming grace and the light that he shares with all who will receive it. Let's very prayerfully and very reverently sing the first and last verse of this great hymn. And I invite you, simply Christ, a simple Christmas, Jesus Christ, at his birth, not only his birth in the world, but his birth in the very center of my life. Let's sing it together, could we? Oh, what's this? All is calm. I need some sleep. <laughs> grant me grant me peace within, Lord. Please grant us peace with me. Peace within, please. Let's stand. Let's sing and testify together to that fourth verse. It's a beautiful verse. Notice this next line. The child loves pure the beams of grace. Redeeming grace. He saved me. He's saving me. Heavenly Father, we're going to leave this place. But because you're the God with us, we're not going to leave your presence. Because you are God for us, no matter what we face this week, you have conquered that I. You've conquered the sin, and we can be the people of God. And our prayer is that you would not only be saving us, but may redeeming grace be shined upon the path of others this week. And all the people of God said, Amen. God bless you as you go.